Hi, this is Regaline Sabat, also known as Gigi. You're listening to Walk With Me Podcast. Today, we are going to have a motivational discussion with Les Brown. My guest today is Les Brown. Leslie Calvin Brown, also known as Les, is an American motivational speaker, author, former radio DJ, and former television host. Les Brown was a member of the Ohio House of Representatives from 1976 to 1981. Welcome to the show, Les. Thank you very much for having me. And just want to thank you for the work that you're doing, helping to shed light on a very important issue. And just being a source of light in a time when a lot of people are going through a great deal of darkness. Domestic violence has increased dramatically, over 40% since the coronavirus. So the kind of advocacy that you're providing to empower women and men on what we can do to identify the perpetrators, that's so very important. Thank you, Les. I appreciate you. And now, can you start off by telling us a little bit more about you and where you're from? I'm from Miami, Florida. We have more Haitians there than in Haiti. <laughs> 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 Miami, Florida, born in Liberty City, an abandoned building on a floor with my twin brother, Wesley. And I got to call him, have him talk to him today. We talk every day. And we were foster kids and then we were adopted. And when I was in fifth grade, I was labeled educable, mentally retarded and put back from the fifth grade to the fourth grade and, and failed again in the eighth grade at Booker T. Washington High School. And I have been speaking for 52 years, February the 17th. I'll be 76. <laughs> that is absolutely amazing. Now, you actually have a new book coming out as well titled You've Got to Be Hungry. Can you tell us more about your book? Well, it's, it's, it's written really showcasing people like yourself. The work that you're doing is something that as much as you have chosen this, you were chosen for this there are people like yourself who have this drive, this, this willingness to persevere, this hunger to make a difference with their lives, to live a life that will outlive them. People that are hungry are unstoppable. They are driven. And I was hungry to buy my mother a home. I achieved that. I bought her four different homes before she passed at 89. And so people that accomplish things, uh, people who are just average, they read history. People that are hungry, they make history. <laughs> you got to be hungry. I love it. <laughs> now, can you tell us more about your podcast, Les? Well, I, I broadcast on a regular basis telling and sharing with people that you, if you're casual about your dream, your dream will end up a casualty. We have a lot of things working against us. When you're in a culture that marginalizes who you are, there are so many different systems in place, some obvious, some not so obvious, that's designed to keep you back. And so the people that break through, the hungry ones, they find a way to win. No excuse is acceptable. They refuse to be denied. They make no their volume, their, their vitamin, and they continue to persist and come back again and again and again. And so I, I teach people how to develop that kind of mental resolve and the need for working on yourself because it's, 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 you, we need mind power to get through the things that's in front of us. Sometimes it can be very exhausting when you have a, a great deal of opposition uh, coming at you again and again and again when you're told no and, and you run into a proverbial wall or a ceiling. To be able to pick yourself up, I've got a saying that says, if life knocks you down, try and land on your back because if you can look up, you can get up. And so the way that I was able to get here where I am now and speak around the world and train others how to do it is that that mental resolve that, Lord, no matter how bad it is or how bad it gets, I'm going to make it. When I get up in the morning, I say, 
all things work together for good for those who love God and for those who are called according to his purpose. And, and then what I do is I, I read the goals that I want to achieve out of the day. And then I write down seven things that I'm grateful for. We are here because of God's grace and mercy. I have a friend named Orrin Hudson. And if you ask him, how are you doing, Orrin? He'll say, the best day of my life. And I said, every day is that? He said, yes. I said, how can that be? He said, try missing one. I said, you got a point. (laughs) (laughs) That's absolutely correct. I love it. Now, Les, what does motivation mean to you? It it means your willingness to be self-directed, your willingness to have something that gives your life purpose and meaning and significance, something that drives you. People who are motivated, they don't need an alarm clock to get out of bed in the morning to wake up. They wake up automatically. People that are motivated and have a sense of purpose, they are the first ones on the job and the last ones to leave. Uh, They believe in the philosophy, all you can do is all you can do, and all you can do is enough, but make sure you do all you can do. I have pictures of my, my children behind me, and the reason that I have it to remind me to live a life that's driven with a mindset of legacy. Of legacy, Most men die, they have liabilities. I was looking for a guy who taught me in radio and I couldn't find him. And so then I went on Facebook and come to find out he had passed and there was a GoFundMe there for his burial. I said, oh my goodness. And he had been gone for some time. So most men, when they die, they leave liabilities. The people that are hungry, they, they they leave a legacy. They have a goal plan, a goal, and, and they plan to do things with their lives. They create a presence. They have a, a, a spirit of optimism. They are relentless, and, and they continue to go after their dreams, and they fall forward when they stumble, and they have this mindset Lord, whatever I face today, together, you and I can handle it. (laughs) Amen. Very powerful. Now, Les, what does leadership mean to you? Leadership means to me, first of all, you got to lead yourself. That's number one. And that's working on yourself and then having clarity of what it is that you want to do. Self-leadership is the name of the game. And then finding others who share your vision and your values of that which you have identified, that you've said, this is something that I want to do. This is something that I I plan to make an impact with my life. And and when you are able to, to have clarity on that, to visualize that, seeing it complete, and in the process to articulate that and enroll others who share your vision, getting around the right people, people who will hold you accountable, but also you hold them accountable and you hold yourself accountable for the things that you have said, this is what I want to pour myself into. My favorite book says, in order for a man to gain his life, he must lose his life. Something that you lose yourself into. And to me, leadership evolves around something that I feel is a calling. A job is what you get paid for, a calling is what you're made for. And it's it's something that you love so much that you do it for nothing, but you do it so well that people will pay you to do it. Amen. Very inspiring. Now, how important is it to ask for help? It's very important because like at this stage of my life, February 17th, I'll be 76. (laughs) And I teach and have been doing for 52 years Ask for help, not because you're weak, but because you want to remain strong and ask for help and don't stop until you get it. I remember when I was in Los Angeles and one of my mentees, Dwight Pleasure, was there and I had an anxiety attack. And there I was on the 36th floor. And so I came out of my room, running out of my room to get on the elevator. The door opened. 
And then I said, oh, I can't do the elevator. So I went flying down the staircase. When I got outside, I saw Dwight. I was so relieved. I grabbed his hand and held his hand. He knew something was going on with me. He knew that I was nervous and he could tell that I was having some level of anxiety. And he just stood there with me. Now, people, I'm in L.A., some people probably walk by and say, oh, they must have a little relationship going up in there. <laughs> he didn't care. He just stood there with me and talked to me until I calmed down. And I needed that. I needed that at that point in time. I had, I had I just was going through an MRI. And when I was a kid, some older guys put me in a refrigerator and shut the door. And when it was finally discovered, I was in the refrigerator when everybody stopped playing, they opened the door and I fell out and I was unconscious. And ever since then, like I'm scheduled to go get an MRI again, I, I, I have this thing, I'm overcoming claustrophobia. And so this, this has been a challenge for me for some time. I don't get anxiety attacks often, but sometimes I, I have a, a recall of that that moment of what happened to me. And, and so, but they don't happen as frequently as they used to. But I asked Dwight to, to pray for me and to pray with me. And it has been, been very good, been very helpful and healing and calming for me. We all have our thorn of flesh. And so that's mine. I love it. Now, I'm an overcomer of, of anxiety as well. And I would tell you what helped me was a, a quote that I, I came up with in regards to anxiety like fear is only as real as you believe it to be. So you and I have to talk about that, Les. <laughs> okay, I love that. Yes, fear sir. is only as real as you believe it to be. That's that's real. That's right. <laughs> that's your anxiety like fear is only as real as you believe it to be. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Now, Les, when you and I spoke, we discussed the importance of having God first place in our lives. And you you mentioned that, and I'll never forget it. You said, there's no other way. Now, how important is your relationship with God to you? Well, you know, one of the things that, and this is where I want to answer you on this, the, the work that we do, the difference between what we do and what ministers do, ministers preach the gospel about Jesus. I preach the gospel that Jesus preached. They sell the messenger. I sell his message. And I believe that if you put God first, you never come in second. I am here because of God's grace and mercy. I am a 29 year fourth stage cancer conqueror. And the people at Cancer Centers of America, they are amazed with me and my attitude of how I've been dealing with this. There's, there's a difference between, and I see myself not as a religious person, but as a spiritual person. Religious people are afraid of going to hell. Spiritual people have been there. <laughs> Okay. Now, Les, can you tell us more about your experience of overcoming cancer? Because you are truly a cancer conqueror. Well, I eat a lot of rabbit food. <laughs> <laughs> I eat a lot of rabbit. I feel like a silly rabbit. <laughs> <laughs> I I don't do drama. I don't do drama at all. I I I'm always looking at and evaluating the relationships that I have. And I minimize the input of negative people in my life. When someone calls me, I look at it, and it has to go through my filter. Number one, is it positive? Number two, is it purposeful? Is it about what I do and the calling on my life? Three, is it productive? Does it make sense to give some time to this? And four, is it profitable? Can I make some money doing it? And if it does not land on one of those, I'm not going to answer. 
See, life has no duplicate. And if there's anything that we've learned from the coronavirus, is that we want to live life with a sense of urgency. This coming week, I'm going to give a, a message for a friend of mine who has passed from the coronavirus. And it's on Zoom. I find that very unusual. I've never done that before. But what it says, when you lose somebody that you're around the same age, you start reflecting on your own mortality. How much time do I have left? I know that the journey that got me here is much longer than the journey that I have left. And so my goal is to finish strong. My goal is to make a greater impact, to live full and to, as Dr. Miles Monroe would say, rob the cemetery of my potential, of my impact, of my dreams, of the movements, of the ideas and the gifts that I still have in me. Even here at 75, I still got the fire in my belly. And so I still got some stuff in me that I'm going to get out before I leave here. I told my kids, if they tell you that I've died, don't let them embalm me for three days and then sneak down to the funeral parlor and put a microphone in my hand. If I don't grab it and say, you got to be hungry, <laughs> say, dad's gone now. <laughs> Very powerful. Now, can you tell us more about your principle that tomorrow is not promised? I was in Las Vegas sitting at a table with Frank Sinatra, who was a great singer. And I heard him say to a young guy, he said, live each day as if it were your last, because one day it will be. I was in South Africa and I saw this sign, Dr. Miles Monroe, and he was doing a couple seminar. So I went over and I said, hi, I'm Les Brown. The lady said, I know you are. I said, I'd like to see Dr. Miles. And she said, oh, he's doing a couple's seminar. I can't interrupt him. I said, listen, if you let him know that I'm out here, I wrote the forward to his book called Personal Potential. He will call me in the room or he will come out here. She said, I'm going to do something better. I'm going to set up breakfast for you all tomorrow morning. I reluctantly agreed. And the next morning she came out and she said, I'm so sorry. He left much sooner than I thought. And a few weeks later, he died in a plane crash, as you're aware. And it was jarring to me. My mind said, insist, but I didn't listen to my mind. We've all had moments in our lives when we said, boy, if I had listened to my first mind. And so I don't put things off because we don't know how much time we have left. And, and life has no duplicate. We, we only get one shot at this. And my goal is to maximize it. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Very powerful. Now, Les, was there a time in your life journey where you experienced an aha moment? Yes. When I spoke in the Georgia Dome, I encourage the people who are listening to us to watch that video on YouTube, Les Brown speaking in the Georgia Dome to over 80,000 people. I was frightened out of my wits. I don't even remember giving this speech. But what I do remember was my mentor, Mike Williams, who wrote the book, the road to your best stuff. He said, Brownie? I said, yes. He said, what's wrong? I said, man, I can't hear the voices. He said, you are afraid, aren't you? I said, yes, there's 80,000 people out there. I've never spoken before 80,000 people. He said, Brownie, it came to see you. You didn't come to see them. He said, go out there and speak from your heart and make your mother proud. I said, Mike, don't use my mama on me. <laughs> and he gave me the mic and he said, you got this. One of the things I teach, sometimes you have to believe in somebody's belief in you until your belief kicks in. And the way that he looked at me, I felt that he saw me doing it. 
and I, 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 I experienced what he said in my heart. You can do this. You got this. And all I remember then, I stepped out on the stage and I went for it. I've never seen the this, this speech since then. I've never, I've probably seen about 10 minutes of it just as a, a witness, but I'd never ever been able to recall doing it because I was so afraid. I went to the bathroom seven times. <laughs> seven times. Yes, seven is my lucky number. <laughs> now, why is seven your lucky number, Les? Tell us. On February the 17th, I'm one of seven children. Joshua marched around the walls of Jericho seven times. Naaman dipped himself in the River Jordan seven times. Seven is my lucky number. When I go to hotels when I was traveling around the world, I always got a room and there had to be a seven in there somewhere. And it's <laughs> always worked out for me. I love it. Very uplifting. Now, Les, tell us more about the major challenge that you had to overcome in your life. The major challenge that I had to overcome was to believe that I can do what I'm doing now. I didn't attempt to do it for 14 years. There are three types of people. They're winners, they're losers, and they're people who are winners who have not discovered that they have the power to win. And they end up being witnesses, watching other people. And fortunately, Mr. Leroy Washington, who had a personality very much like your personality. And he challenged me. I was in his class. He said, young man, go to the board and work this problem out for me. I said, sir, I can't do that. He said, why not? I'm not one of your students. He said, do it anyhow. I said, I can't, sir. The other students started laughing, saying, he's Leslie. He's got a twin brother, Wesley. Wesley's smart. He's DT. And he asked, what's DT? He's the dumb twin. And they all started laughing at me. And I said, I am, sir. And he came from behind his desk and he pointed at me. He said, don't you ever say that again. Someone's opinion of you does not have to become your reality. Do you hear me? I said, yes, sir. Yes, sir. And, and what he did was how we live our lives is a result of the story we believe about ourselves. When you come on with your podcast, what you do is distract, dispute, and inspire. You distract a person from the story they will believe they believe about themselves. And through the execution of your presentation or the, your interviewing guests, you dismantle their current belief system. You expand their vision of themselves, and they become as a pencil in the hand of God from listening to you and start writing a new chapter with their lives. Distract, dispute, and inspire. And that moment helped me to begin to see myself beyond being the dumb twin. That moment helped me to begin to understand the words, be not conformed to this world, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And as a result of my wanting to be like him, and I took him on unbeknownst to him as my spiritual father. I've never known my own father. And, and I followed him, how he dressed and how he said, I'm going to be as good as you. He said, you'll be better than me. I said, I could never be that good, sir. At his funeral, when I eulogized him, we called him the great communicator because truly he was a great communicator. Amen. Very powerful. Now, Les, how important is it to have a positive attitude? It is very important. People who don't have positive attitudes have skinny children. <laughs> They don't do anything with their lives. You know, they just say, oh, I can't do it. They have a I can't do it attitude. I would, but I coulda, woulda. That kind of conversation that doesn't lead anywhere. It's very important. And it's challenging to maintain it in this type of environment. 
I encourage everybody listening to go to hungrytospeak.com. And the reason is that there's a set of, of motivational messages called Choosing Your Future, the best work I've ever done. And as they listen every day, day in and day out, it's going to change how they see themselves. Their income is going to increase they will upgrade their relationships because they'll realize who you run with determines who you end up with. But most importantly, it's going to create a major shift in their attitude about themselves. The biggest thing I've ever done was to believe that I can do what I'm doing. Three years into doing what I'm doing now, but the most challenging was to believe that I can stand on stage, no college education, being labeled educable, mentally retarded, put back from the fifth grade to the fourth grade, failing again in the eighth grade at Booger T. Washington High School, and could speak to people who had PhDs and MBAs and years of college or corporate experience that I did not have, and to command a listening, a committed listening. And so self-development is very important, especially now. Over 47 million jobs will be lost because of the coronavirus. And so the people that are going to live their dreams rather than their fears, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of love, you know, and a power of a sound mind, that they, they will challenge themselves to raise the bar on themselves, to push themselves, to, to find out what they're made of. And so life is, is a, it's an adventure. I think we're here to do the greater work. And I'm always looking for ways in which we can push the envelope. Hearing my father glorified that ye bear much fruit, that we are supposed to be very productive while we're here. Amen. Very powerful. Now, Les, what is your best advice to the audience for walking with purpose and living a life of happiness? Find something that that's you. Something that you love so much you do it for nothing, but you do it so well that people will pay you to do it. I, I spoke and volunteered and never got paid. I remember the first time a church said, we love you so much. You did such a great job. And they gave me a $25 love offering. I said, we love you and Jesus loves you too. I said, thank you very much. <laughs> but who would have thought from that beginning? Now I earn $70,000 an hour. I remember I would work a whole year and not make $70,000 when I speak in the United States when I was speak outside of the United States, earn $225,000 an hour. And so the, the ability to transform your life, if you're willing to learn, if you're not willing to learn, nobody can help you. But if you're willing to learn in this era where we are, the era of what Peter Drucker calls the era of the three C's, accelerated change, overwhelming complexity, and tremendous competition. If you're willing to learn, no one can stop you. And so your willingness to learn, I had to learn how to do what I'm doing now. I was willing to invest in myself. Warren Buffett, who's a billionaire, they ask him, what is the most important investment a person can make? And the, he has billions of dollars in real estate, as you know, and billions of dollars in the stock market. And he said, the most important investment you can make is in yourself. So I encourage people to go to hungrytospeak.com and watch the seminar, free workshop conversation with my son, John Leslie, talking about strategies and speaking, and also get the free Motivational message, choosing your future. 
and also they're so moved to do so to what invest in themselves the gold package of how they can begin to speak from home and make money virtually i did four seminars today four i just couldn't say no to seventy thousand dollars in my <laughs> mickey mouse pajamas <laughs> 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 oh my goodness. Thank you, Lord. Somebody's got to get this money. <laughs> In their Mickey Mouse pajamas. I'll remember that. <laughs> I love yeah. it. Les, it has been such an honor to have you here today. Thank you for being a guest on Walk With Me podcast. Now, where can the audience find you? Well, if they go to hungry to speak com. They can leave a message for me there. But also, if they're interested in one-on-one -on -one coaching, which I want you, uh, you are just an incredible person. Oh, my goodness. You got a story. They can email me at lesbrown77 at gmail.com. That's lesbrown77 at gmail.com. Because this is a time we've gone from brick and mortar to click and order. And the majority of, of the money that will be made will be made seated in front of a computer. That's exciting. I love that. I have a friend named Tyrone. I'm bilingual. I speak squirrely. He's a squirrel. And so he's waiting on me now. <laughs> he said, land the plane, Mr. Brown. And so I will choose. <laughs> You can tell the walls are closing in on me. I'm talking to squirrels. <laughs> <laughs> but if they email me, they have an interest. You can have fun, change lives, and live a life that will outlive you. I can get that story out of you and teach you how to monetize it. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. I love it. Ladies and gentlemen, make sure to check out Les Brown at HungryToSpeak.com and his email, lesbrown77 at gmail.com. And Les, again, thank you so much for being a guest on Walk With Me podcast. I appreciate you. Oh, thank you so much. And thank you for who you are. You are powerful. I am, I'm just so excited about working with you. We're going to do some great things together. Bye Likewise. now. Thank you. <laughs>